Greetings once again to the Morning Star Missionary Baptist Church family. I'm delighted once again to be able to come to you in this manner. Uh, as always, I do miss the fellowship of the saints very much, but I thank God that we are still able to receive his word and to continue to do and discharge our responsibilities, especially as it pertains to the sheep of his pasture. Moreover, I ask in Jesus' name that he would bless us. This pandemic that we're in the midst of is still getting worse. It has not been getting better, but uh, we're going to press our way on and see what the end of this is going to be. I also want to let you know that uh, we are canceling, as you know, Vacation Bible School would have been this past week. Uh, that obviously was canceled. We're also canceling our worship in the park service as well as uh, community cookout. Unfortunately, male chorus anniversary as well will have to be canceled. Uh, we just cannot run the risk of trying to get together right now with numbers continuing to increase here in the state of North Carolina. Um, if you pay attention to the news, you see one state, my home state of Texas, is already talking about going back to phase one, telling people to stay home. And if we're not careful, North Carolina might end up back in phase one as well. And while we don't want to do that for the sake of the health of the people of this state, we may have to do that. So pray for our governor, pray for our mayors, Pray for our president, pray for everyone, because this is serious what we're going through. And we need to be careful. The loss of life is too great, especially when one of those lives is in your family and you know it could have been prevented. So bless us to do our part, Lord, and bless everyone. Bless everyone and keep us safe. That is our prayer. Amen. Um, this morning, I want to direct your attention to the book of James, the fourth chapter in the book of James. While you are turning there, please remember uh, loved ones in prayer. We thank God Deacon Kelly is at home. Praise the Lord for that. Yeah, I'm so happy to hear that news. And then um, continue to pray for all our deacons and deaconess all the known sick of this church family, um, everybody needs prayer, y'all. So pray for everyone. Call and check on people, please. Don't let one person and put that responsibility on just one person. Call and check on folk and make sure that everyone's doing well, that everyone's doing okay. If you run into a problem, please let myself know. Let our chairman of the deacon board know if there is a problem. And uh, Morningstar can do what we can to try to alleviate those problems as God enables us to. Now then, let us bow our heads for opening word of prayer. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we come to you to ask God that you would bless us right now. Bless me as I preach this message. Bless the message and then bless the hearers, Lord. Faith cometh by hearing, the Bible says, and hearing by the word of God. Let your Holy Spirit take charge. Show us your greatness. Show us that you are not bound. Show us, God, that you are able to be here and there at the very same time. Show us your awesomeness. Show us the power of your might. Show us your Holy Spirit and reveal to us, Lord God, the understanding of your word. Write it in our hearts and bless us, Lord God, to always remember it that we might not sin against you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. James chapter four, I only want to read one verse for your hearing today, and that is James chapter four and just verse number eight. Verse number eight. And reading from the King James Version of the Bible, this is what verse 8 says. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Let me read that one more time. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, 
and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. For a subject, I want to be preaching on our theme for this year, which is finding God. And I want to talk about finding God in your heart. Finding God in your heart. Jesus said something to the Pharisees when they demanded to know from him when the kingdom of God should come. He answered them saying this, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. That comes from Luke 17, verses 20 and 21. His answer to the Pharisee's question ought to bother us. Why should it bother us? What does he mean by saying the kingdom of God is within you? Most of us are looking for a physical manifestation that will be descending from the sky. After all, we recall it was Jesus that said, again in Luke 21, verse 27, and reading this from the NIV version, at that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But we forget another scripture that is key to seeing God, our Father. Jesus told us this in his Sermon on the Mount. And it is found in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 8. And it says this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Now, you need to know that the converse of this scripture is also true. This is the converse of that scripture. Cursed are the unpure in heart, for they shall not see God. Sometimes to amplify the positive, we also have to see the negative. And the negative of that sounds so harsh to us that it, make, it ought to make us desire even more the positive of that. Again, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The heart, my brothers and sisters, is key in all of this because we already know Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 tells us, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Hence, my brothers and sisters, the need for every one of us to purify our hearts. The first thing I want to talk about out of this text is the first point that this text draws for us. It says in the text, draw nigh to God. So I want to talk about drawing nigh to God. Since Jesus departed this earth and returned to heaven to sit on the right hand of the Father, I think it's safe to say that mankind has been caught up in a downward spiral. This has nothing to do with his ability to keep us. It has everything to do with our own selfish desires. We've seen sin running rampant across this earth, but it has also affected the church and in particular it has affected his followers. Now I'm talking about, yes, us, Christians. We have been affected by the sin that is running rampant across the face of this earth. Far too many are now trying to achieve holiness through our own ability. And all we have succeeded in doing is to enslave ourselves to the bondage 
of legalism. If you don't know what that means, you got to go back and catch last Sunday's sermon. Legalism has bound so many of us because we look at the word and instead of seeing it as spiritual and alive and life-giving, we see it as a rule and a law and therefore a legal document, something that we simply have to obey. Nothing more. Void of belief. All we have to do is obey. When we try to do things our own way, my brothers and sisters, we set goals that are lower than the standards of God. We will even take away from the true meaning of scripture to make ourselves look like we are doing well in our walk with Jesus. I believe this is what Isaiah was alluding to in Isaiah chapter 53 in verse 6 when he said all we like sheep have gone astray listen to this we have turned every one to his own way too many are trying to draw near to God in their own way rather than the way that Jesus has told us to. Many would rather follow man-made rules and man-made and man-written guidelines instead of following the word of God. We will stand and tout that I've got my constitution and it says, but who wrote that constitution? Is that in the Bible or did man write that constitution? Well, we've got a policy here that says, who wrote that policy? Did man write that policy or did God write that policy? But Isaiah had somewhat to say even about that. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse number 8, he said it plainly to us, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Others have even tried to attain holiness by obeying the letter of the New Testament. Now, pastor, what do you mean when you say that? Well, what I'm talking about is we look at the Bible as the legal document and we if we have not done what it said do not do, then we get a star, we get a pat on the back, we get a badge, we lift ourselves up because we say, you know what? I'm doing just fine. But how quickly do we forget what Jesus has taught us about the Bible, that having broken one is the same as having broken all of the commandments of the Bible. Many would rather follow those man-made rules because it's too hard to walk by the letter of the New Testament. And those that do have personally failed miserably. Doing this is no different, my brothers and sisters, than what the Jews were trying to do as Christianity began to spread. They tried it, albeit unsuccessfully, to receive salvation by keeping the letter of the law. They wanted the Old Testament law, and they said, if I keep this, then I attain salvation. But doing so is salvation apart from from Christ. And besides that, the law is not able to keep you from sinning. The law instead proves us guilty of sin. No one can keep the letter of the law because the letter of the law proves us all to be transgressors. Even after Jesus gave us a new commandment here in the New Testament that we ought to love one another. Look at the world today. Do we love one another? Look at the church today. Do we love one another? Look at our own family tree. Do we love one another? The answer to all of them has to be no. Because in order to answer yes, there cannot be a single person that you like less than another person. There cannot be a single person that you hate 
in any of those categories and then you want to draw nigh unto God, we cannot have relationship with him if we're going to try to do things our own way. And doing our way is what messes us up to begin with. No, we have not obeyed even that commandment to love one another. Another, But my brothers and sisters, you've got to catch this. God is not looking for an outward form of godliness. He wants an inward change of the heart. That's what God wants. He doesn't want us to walk around and on the outside we look holy. He wants the change to happen in our heart. It's like scripture, which says, first make clean the inside of the cup. Then the outside will truly be clean. To have a closer relationship with God, your heart must be pure. To draw near to him, your heart must be pure. Holiness, my brothers and sisters, is a work of God's grace and not a self-made restriction of the flesh. You can try your best all you want, but the flesh continually wars against the spirit that is in us. And let's be honest, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, says there have been times, not a time, but times within us when the flesh has won out over our spirit. So we've got to know that holiness has to be a work of God's grace. That leads me, my brothers and sisters, to my second point. First, he said, draw nigh unto God. Second, he says, cleanse your hands. We could wash our hands all day long. And never remove the stains of our sinful doings. We could sterilize, because we got sterilizer today. We could sterilize our hands all day long and still not be able to remove the stain of sin that is upon our hands. Now, one might wonder, Pastor, how do the hands relate to the defiling of the heart. Well, my brothers and sisters, consider this. Our hands are forever participating in our sinfulness. Yes, it is. Listen, does one steal without using their hands? Does one look at an inappropriate magazine without using their hands? Does one fornicate without using their hands? I could keep going naming sins in which our hands are constantly involved. Our hands, my brothers and sisters, are forever participating in our sinfulness. That's why the Bible is so urgent with us to cease from sinning. Isaiah chapter 1 verses 15 and 16 tell us this. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease. God says, to do evil. Everything that we do, my brothers and sisters, affects our heart. We have accepted so much sinfulness into our heart that the heart has become defiled. Now let me go a little further in telling you what a defiled heart means. Instead of standing up to sin, rebuking it, and forgiving the sinner who repents, we've become comfortable with it and will even defend sometimes 
that sinfulness. The world is trying to redefine Christianity and to teach worldly convictions which they think are better than the word of God. You know how the world today in this age, in this century, looks at the word of God. It is old. It needs to be updated. It needs to be changed. What they're really saying is this. We need to bend God's rules to allow us to do what we want to do to achieve holiness. God changes not. His word changes not. You can't add to it and you can't take away from it. His word is what he said. His word is what he meant. And his word is what shall judge us. Jesus on the judgment seat. And we all must come before him to give an account. Worldly theology says, don't judge anyone. It says, accept them for who they want to be. It says, appreciate their uniqueness. The world doesn't like the true Christian because the true Christian will only adhere to the word of God. And will not allow the world to bend it, twist it, remove it, nor put something in place of it. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I ask you, is what the world wants to call holiness really holiness? The answer is no. But the Bible says in Proverbs 21 and verse 2, a person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. It's not what we say that he's paying attention to. He's looking at the heart because the heart cannot be fooled. We know when we're guilty. We know it because we feel it in our heart. We can speak a lie out of our mouth. Who took this? It wasn't me, but in the heart we're trembling, hoping they don't find out it really was me. The heart, my brothers and sisters, cannot lie. But this little muscle in our mouth as James says, can kindle a great fire. My brothers and sisters, to wash or cleanse the hands is emblematic of the putting away of sins. So when he says cleanse your hands, it's the same thing as him saying put away your sinful ways. Put away your sinful actions. Put away your sinful deeds. Put away your sinful thoughts. Everything that is an abomination before me, put it all away. Remember, Pilate literally demonstrated that for us when he had Jesus before him. And they wanted him to condemn Jesus. But Pilate demonstrated it for us when he washed his hands before the multitude, condemning Jesus, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Listen to how God feels about our sinful condition. This is from Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. We've got to cleanse our hands, my brothers and sisters. We've got to cease from doing evil. Doing so will affect your heart for the better. But nevertheless, there's one other thing he says here in this text. Draw nigh to God. Cleanse your hands. But then he says, purify your hearts. That's my final point for today. 
The Bible tells us in the book of James, chapter 1, in verse number 8, that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Why go there? Because it's the example that he has. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. But did you not also know that the Bible says in Psalm 119, verse number 113, it begins this way, I hate double-minded men. One will either encounter double-minded men or one will show that he or she is double-minded. What do you mean, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. Uncommitted people who profess to know Christ can hinder us spiritually as much as those who deny him outright. Uncommitted people who profess to know Christ can discourage us from standing fast for Christ and living in obedience to his command. Uncommitted people who profess to know Christ may even oppose us when our faithful lives conflict or expose the inconsistencies that are in their lives. Many of today's Christians have settled for an outward adorning of Christianity while their heart has remained unchanged. This allows one to look churchy on Sunday, but worldly the rest of the week. To dress up on Sunday, but dress provocatively the rest of the week. God doesn't want us living this way. Sinful living, my brothers and sisters, contaminates the heart. Therefore, to purify our hearts, we must go through a purification process. And we learn from Malachi chapter 3 and verse 3 that he shall sit as a refiner and purifier and he shall purify a pure heart. Before God is just like pure gold. Pure gold, my brothers and sisters, is beautiful. Yet it is also soft. It is tender. And it is pliable. But did you not know that to make gold pure, it must first be ground into a powder and a substance called flux, must be added to it. Then the ground up gold with the added flux is put into a furnace and it is heated until it melts. The impurities that are in the gold will attach themselves to the flux while the heavier gold sinks down to the bottom. Then my brothers and sisters. Once the separation has occurred. The impurities can be removed. And what remains is pure gold. I my brothers and sisters. Can hear him saying. Our furnace. Are the trials and the tribulations. That he allows into our lives. Our flux is the word of God which draws the impurities of our heart out and makes them visible. To whisk it away is the blood of Jesus which removes every sinful stain. But I also see something else there in the text. I saw it at the very beginning of this verse. I see an assurance there in the text because he said draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto me I see an assurance there oh blessed assurance Jesus 
is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I am an heir. Say that again. I am an heir. One more time so you can understand it. I am an heir of his salvation. Why? I've been purchased by God. Born of his spirit. Yes, and I've been washed in his blood. That's the purification process. I've got to go through the fire. Although it ain't my desire. But this I know. That my moment of affliction will not exceed the eternal glory. That I shall receive when at the judgment seat. Therefore, I must go through the fire. Because this is my story. The question, my brothers and sisters, is what is yours? There may be someone here today listening to the sound of my voice, viewing this sermon online. And you know your heart is not right. Let me save you the trouble and tell you plainly, you can't get it right. But I know someone who can. How do I know? Because I gave him this heart a long time ago. Vile, defiled, rotten to the core. And ever since that day, He's been cleaning it up. I'm not yet what I ought to be. But I thank God I'm not what I used to be. Oh, for the joy that he has given me. Yes, I've been in the furnace. I've had trials. I've been through some tribulations. But one thing I know, his promise is true. Never will I leave you nor forsake you. And God has kept his promise. And if he did that for a wretch like me, he will do that for you. Let today be the day that you accept Christ as your Lord, as your Savior. Let today be the day that the miracle happens, for ye must be born again. Not of the flesh, but of the spirit. How do I do that? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, the Bible says, thou shalt be saved. Bow your head and pray this prayer with me. If that is your desire. Father in heaven, I confess to you, I am a sinner, lost in a world of sin. But I have heard there is a Savior seated on the right hand of the Father who has shed his blood and paid the price for the penalty of my sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And for what I've done, I deserve to die. But he took my place at Calvary. And there he paid my price. He died. And I die with him. But he arose. Three days later. And said. All power. In heaven. And earth. Is given unto me. Therefore we know. If our life be hid in Christ, we rise in him and our life 
is eternal with him in the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, Lord, for saving a wretch like me. Amen. That's all it takes. You have to believe. And you have to believe in here. And you'll know when that change has occurred. You will know. I have preached many times by the grace of God. I've seen people come to Christ with tears flowing down their eyes. And I've seen others skipping down the aisle, waving at their friends because they were joining their friend's church. God has said in his word, when the sorting is done, he'll separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep will go into the kingdom, but the goats will not be able to go. Make sure you are one of his sheep. Let us bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this message for today. We ask your blessings upon all that may hear this message. Let it resonate within their hearts. Let it bother them day and night if they are not saved. And let them hear over and over and over again your word, the scriptures. Let them hear it in their heart. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let them hear your word in their heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.